Good morning, everyone. I'm Eric Sargent. About 30 years ago, Thich Nhat Hanh, the Vietnamese Buddhist monk and activist, was looking for an English word to describe our deep interconnection with everything else. He liked the word togetherness, but finally he came up with the neologism interbeing, and he wrote, the verb to be can be misleading because we cannot be by ourselves alone. To be is always to interbe. If we combine the prefix inter with the word to be, we have a new verb, interbe. To interbe and the action of interbeing reflects reality more accurately. We inter are with one another and with all life. As an example, he says, if you are a poet, you will see clearly that there's a cloud floating the sheet of paper. For without the cloud, there will be no rain, and without the rain, a tree cannot grow, and without trees, we cannot make paper. <coughs> the cloud is essential for the paper to exist. If the cloud is not here, the sheet of paper cannot be here either. It's through that lens that I present a tale of two cities and two environmental insults. The first is in Tennessee. In December 2008, a retention wall at the Kingston Fossil Power Plant, which is a coal power generation plant in Kingston, Tennessee, failed. About 525 million gallons of wet coal ash, which is a byproduct of coal-fired power generation, the process of which concentrates its impurities, which include arsenic, lead, and mercury, among other potentially toxic contaminants, spilled into the nearby <coughs> Tennessee River. This was enough slurry to flood more than 3,000 acres of nearby land. Although the sludge destroyed 12 homes, no one was directly injured. However, an unprecedented fish kill occurred in the Tennessee River, an area tributary to areas in the aftermath of the spill. According to the Tennessee Valley, Valley Authority, which owns the plant, a test of river water near the spill site found elevated lever, levels of lead and thallium, both of which have been linked to birth defects and nervous and reproductive system disorders. However, the TVA reassured locals that although these substances exceeded safe limits for drinking water, they would be filtered out by normal water treatment processes. North of the Kingston plant, Oak Ridge, uh, where my wife comes from, is the site of the National Laboratory that employs many PhD. It has a median family income of $69,000 and an 88% high school graduation rate. South of the plant, in the path of the spill, Rockwood has a medium, median plant of in, median income of $32,000 and 69% of completed high school. Meanwhile, more close to home, areas of downriver Detroit are plagued by dust from petroleum coke, which is a solid byproduct of tar sand oil production uh, at the Marathon Petroleum Plant. It's used in power generation, and kilns that smelt metals and manufacture cement. The cement has been, the material rather, has been stored there before export or local use. The dust is very fine and can evade the normal filtering processes of the airway and lodge in the lungs, which in itself is unhealthy. Although the material is considered to have low toxicity, the material near the Marathon refinery contains small amounts of vanadium, which is a toxic metal. Neighborhoods around the Myth Marathon site have some of the lowest median family incomes in southeastern Michigan. Spring Wells is $29,000, Melvindale is $37,000, River Rouge is $27,000. And the Detroit High School graduation rate is about 80%. I don't know what that particular local uh, environment is, though. The neighborhoods surrounding the site are mixed in race with areas of predominantly white and areas of predominantly Latinx or black. It's probably fair to say that the experiences of these communities is far from the experience we enjoy in our leafy environments of Bloomfield Hills and Birmingham. Just as Thich Nhat Hanh's reference to inner being reminds us of the fabric of existence that we share, the neologism intercause could indicate the dense web of causality in which decisions and outcomes, whether of citing of hazardous waste or materials or justice or school quality come together. You really can't tug on one thread of our social fabric. A low-income population, for example, with limited educational opportunities and inadequate political representation, for example, without finding how firmly attached it is to the eventual site of a potential environmental hazard. Does the existence of a low-income area with limited educational opportunities itself allow the environmental hazard to interbe? I would propose that yes, 
If there were no place to store coal ash or use for pet coke, coal ash and pet coke would not be made. All of this can lead to despair. It might lead you to say, how can I change anything? To that I would say, even now you are. And it was in this spirit that your Green Sanctuary Ministry and Social Justice Committee resolved at our retreat in February to join forces and take in the broader view, recognizing that these issues cannot be separated, truly. So with every letter you send or visit you make to your representatives, you remind them of their, their duty to serve the public good, including environmental issues. With every hour you spend with your own children or tutoring, tutoring in Pontiac or other schools, you're empowering a child to eventually question decisions that lead to environmental degradation. Every rally that you attend and every citizen's petitions drive that you work on to increase fair, fairness and political apportionment strengthens our democratic ideals that can allow fair treatment of populations with respect to environmental issues. Every effort you make to reduce the obscene income inequality that characterizes our modern gilded age, with every decision you make to reduce your use of non-renewable fuels and materials, with the time and resources you give to your church community that in turn provides a space for individuals and families to come together and think deeply about these issues. With all of these things and so many more, you are relieving the fabric of inner causality and inner being that contains the environmental issues, large and small, that we face. And to that I say, let us be hopeful, let us be possible, po positive, and let's not get too down about it. Thank you. My name is Jane O'Neill, and I'm co-chair of the environment, Social and Environmental Justice sorry, Committee with Eric Sargent, and also a member of the former co-chair of the Green Sanctuary Committee. Um, I've been involved in various kinds of work to correct the damage we're doing to our environment for many, many years. I've been on this mission at my children's schools, they're now out of college, uh, every place I've worked, and here at BUC. Now, nothing would make me happier than to find out that climate change is a hoax. I'd be mad for a minute, but my emotional pendulum would swing very quickly to jumping for joy if I were to find out that I'd been fooled all this time and we really have nothing to worry about. But it's not a hoax. Climate change is happening. I know there are still many people in the world who are trying to convince themselves it isn't true, but they're wrong. There are many, many dire reports from many reliable sources of how much damage has already been done and how bad things will get if we don't get a handle on things. A lot of my motivation, motivation for this work comes from fear. Fear of what will happen if we don't get things right. Fear of what will happen to my children and their children and all of our children. And the fear can become a huge burden. The fear and the fatigue of continuing our work in the face of resistance when we hear about fossil fuel producers and corporations and our own government. It's hard to keep explaining that the cold weather in Marquette doesn't mean that the earth isn't warming overall. And that even though the recycling industry is going through adjustments, we should keep on recycling. Or better yet, turn our focus to buying items that don't need to be recycled in the first place. But what's most disheartening is the thought that people may give up hope. I've been asked by younger people that I work with whether I believe there's still time for us to turn things around. Or have we already gone too far? Is there any way we can still solve this? Or is it just too big? They ask if there's a reason to be hopeful. I do have hope, and today I want to tell you why. I hope that we can help climate change because I hear news all the time of people all over the world who are working to solve it. People who are a lot smarter than I am, thank goodness. People like, and I'll get these names for you because you can watch all their TED Talks. People like Christiana Figueres, the diplomat who's called the architect of the Paris Climate Accord. She came to Ann Arbor a few weeks ago and spoke at the University of Michigan, and some of us watched a tape of her talk. We, she said that while we have a very long way to go, and we need to get there very quickly, <coughs> there has been a lot of progress, which she described in her speech. Because people around the world are putting their creativity and their ingenuity into solutions. People like Johan Rockström of the Stockholm Resilience Center who led the team which developed the Planetary Boundaries Framework, which is a way of managing human development at a global level. Paul Hawken, who created Project Drawdown, and 
gathered together dozens of scientists to come up with the identify the 100 best solutions to climate change, gave us all a, a framework to work against. And we got word yesterday that my congressman, and maybe yours, Andy Levin, has become Michigan's first co-sponsor of the Energy Innovation Act. But the people who give me the most hope are our young people, people like Greta Thunberg, the 15-year-old Swede who led the student walkouts all over the world and who spoke truth to power at the British Parliament last week, and Varshini Prakash, a 25-year-old from Boston who's leading the Sunrise Movement, which is a youth movement, movement which is demanding action from our leaders. These young people give me so much hope. They are insisting that we stop doing business as usual because we're stealing their future before their very eyes. This past week, there were demonstrations all over the world. Ms. Figueres compared the civil disobedience to the civil rights movement of the 60s and the suffragettes of a century ago. She said, it's not the first time in history we've seen angry people take to the streets when the injustice has been great enough. Which leads me to another reason that I have hope. We here on Earth have certainly addressed huge problems in the past. Here are a few examples of problems where we have achieved achieved success. These things haven't been 100% fixed, but in each case, we have come a long way toward improvement. Polio, there have been no new cases of polio in the United States since 1979. Smoking, from 1965 to 2006, rates of smoking cigarettes in the US have declined from 42% to 20%. Global poverty. Since 1990, the percentage of people living below the extreme poverty line have gone from 36% to 9. That's over a billion people whose lives have been improved and who are on a path to more improvement. This was through the work of many groups of people who coordinated their efforts together to achieve their goals. If we work together globally, we can address huge issues and make them better. And we do have the innovation and knowledge to fix climate change, and we're making more advances every day. I have a few hopes I'd like to share with you. I hope that we can leave a legacy not of destruction and death, but of innovation and collaboration and an even better life for beings, all beings on this planet. I hope we can save all the wonderful things humanity has brought, the art and the literature and the love and the passion we show for each other, I want that to remain so future generations can be awed and thrilled and inspired to make more. I hope that together with our young people, we can be the generations that fix the problems, that what happens in the next few decades is a turning point in human history, that we and these courageous young people are the ones who loved each other enough to live out our hope for a bright future. Let us all live out our hope for the earth and for a long and brilliant future on this planet. Let us love each other enough to do what we must to save our habitat for ourselves and for future generations. I'm Dan Kasu, a very good father of the Green Sanctuary. <laughs> Recently, a number of us were, uh, participated in a discussion of the UUA's All Church Reading, uh, this book, Justice on Earth, People of Faith Working at the Intersections of Race, Class, and the Environment. As the title indicates, the book focuses on the intersectionality of these issues. We learned that every issue is a justice issue. Every issue is an environmental issue. Every issue is an issue of faith. Intersectionality gets at some very important truths. As John Muir wrote over a century ago, when we try to pick out anything by itself, we find it hitched to everything else in the universe. The fact that we humans can think about intersectionality at all is astounding. And it turns out that this ability is itself hitched to everything else about humanity. I'd like to point out the intersections of four ideas. First, human beings are apparently unique 
insofar as we've evolved an outsized cerebral content, cortex that facilitates memory and analysis. Second, these abilities are essential to our understanding of cause and effect, leading to our ability to make consequential choices. Third, we use language to enable cooperation largely by sharing understandings of sequential events. And finally, the, that narrative formula of consequential actions leading to particular outcomes is basic to human agency. From an evolutionary standpoint, our huge brains gave us an advantage in the struggle for survival by relatively weak creatures in a world of predators, parasites, and pathogens. These challenges favored the development of cooperative, cooperative behaviors facilitated by language, which enabled humans to share experiences, purposes, and strategies. We see connections between events. We recognize that actions have consequences, and our deeds have real and somewhat predictable outcomes. Giving rise to intention as we choose to act in ways that will likely be to our benefit. We understand ourselves as agents in a responsive reality, but with the implication that we are somehow separate from that reality, the natural world that is out there someplace. We are the protagonists in an ongoing story, one that began at the very dawn of human experience. Narrative has evolved as a strategy for survival and, some, and continues to influence our choices as we negotiate a modern landscape beset with dangers not of predators, but of ideologies. And therein lies a problem. As sociobiologist E. O. Wilson points out, we have created a Star Wars civilization with Stone Age emotions, medieval institutions, and godlike technologies. Our decisions, policies, and actions, our hearts and minds, are deeply influenced by our engagement with stories that define our roles as we live out our lives in this material world. We are bound by meta-narratives that are begotten of our genetic and mimetic heritages, mythological understandings of who we are and what we are capable of as individuals, as communities, and as a species. These stories bind us together, but they can also lead to tribalism, nationalism, racism, and otherisms of all kinds. They are the means by which we have overcome the limits of biological evolution, generating the intricate webs of behavior that have enabled us to adapt to every kind of environment. They are the source of myths, legends, stories, histories that make up our culture and inform us, inform us of how we ought to live, providing purpose and meaning for our lives. Unfortunately, they can also limit the development of new, new ways of meeting the challenges of survival. These meta narratives have their roots in our DNA, but they are not immutable. In fact, we continually reconstruct our stories, and in so doing, we participate in the creation of the world that is coming into being, for good or for ill. Eric has, Eric has shared stories this morning of disasters backed up with facts and figures. He has shown us some of the connections, the intersections of power and poverty, of privilege and pollution. Too often, we in the wealthy West have accepted this situation as normal. We have become anesthetized to the anguish that is attendant on our lifestyle. We can become cynical, believing that nothing we do can make a difference. After all, we've heard this story so often, for so long, it's easy to believe. Jane has also made factual claims, listing a number of problems that have been overcome by human beings. She rightly points out that we have the knowledge, the resources, and the skills to deal with climate change. 
We need only the political will to do so. I recently read that 30 years ago, environmental journalist Dick Russell summarized what we then knew about climate disruption <coughs> and what we could do to prevent the worst of the consequences. Russell criticized the Reagan administration for kicking the can down the road. Now, with scientists telling us that we have less than 20 years to meet the challenge, we have a president who denies the can's very existence. Always, so many stories. Television and now the internet have given us access to an amazing profusion of information, but we have the sense of being lost at sea. What is true? Is it really possible to feed a population of 10 billion people without using petrochemicals? Can renewables really supply our energy needs? Is the Green New Deal realistic? Or is climate change really a hoax per perpetrated by liberal socialists? Will the economy collapse if we regulate carbon production? Is immigration a threat to our cultural identity or a boon to our economic success? Is increased military spending a waste of resources? Or is it essential to our national security? Do guns really make us safer? There are apocalyptic stories being written today. Stories of ecological collapse, of environmental refugees, of mass migrations, of the rise of nationalism, of global warfare, of the end of civilization. And there are stories of removal, of sustainable energy technologies, of international initiatives, to reduce carbon outputs, of cures for disease, of the dawning of a new age of prosperity and cooperation. The internet has made the world into a global village, but it remains to be seen how that village will create its history. We at BUC share a number of stories. We tell of our origins in 1949, of 19 people who had a vision for a new church with a liberal message of hope. We take pride in our beautiful building designed by acclaimed architect Minoru Yamasaki. We revel in tales of our years under the charismatic leadership of Bob Marshall when we join with our neighbors in Pontiac to fight for school desegregation. We celebrate that until Sunday every year as we remember our commitment to maintaining a hate-free zone for the LGBTQ community. We go all out for rummage twice a year with all the traditions that are so dear to us. We celebrate Earth Day and the Harvest Potluck as a certified green sanctuary. We have a rich and proud history. We have played an important role in the world, not only locally, but across the state, the nation, and even the globe. I would ask you to consider what part will we play in the story of the 21st century? Will we rise to the challenges ahead? How will the life of this church intersect with the narrative of climate disruption? How will we engage our hearts and minds to make this story one of hope?